Hi guys, welcome to the third class on computer control systems, now from my place. So, today we are going to talk about the black box. And the black box is about the description of the system that only takes in consideration the input and the output, not what is in, what's inside. Later on in this semester, we will be talking about a description, which is a state space description, that is like a white box in the sense that, sense that it's transparent. We will make the description of the state variables inside the system. But at this moment, we only take the input and the output. So when we are talking about the transfer function, we are talking about the relationship between the input and the output of the system. So the Z transforms, of course, because we are on the Z domain. And in the first semester, we had like the pole, pole zero map as a way to describe the dynamics of the system. So the minute you add this footprint, this signature of the system, you could immediately, or after some experience that you already have, you could take if the system was stable or not stable, oscillatory or damped or fast or slow. So this picture, this pole zero map would be uh, uh, easy way to get directly to the dynamics of the system and you know that these poles and zeros are just the roots of the denominator and the numerator of the transfer function so the question that arises is do we also have this for the discrete time domain and the answer is yes we do so let's start by the basic requirement which is stability and for stability you know that in the first semester you needed that all poles should be to the left of um, of um, the imaginary axis for the system to be stable so it was like this borderline for the stability it was like this vertical line and everything that goes beyond this point would make would have catastrophic results in the sense that the system would become unstable now we have to you know this picture of the the guys that uh, that think that the, the world is flat and it's like a disc Okay, we're not talking about that, we are talking about stability of discrete time system and for the stability of the discrete time system, stability region will be exactly a disk, a unitary disk. So a disk that goes from 1 to minus 1 to j to minus j and you have to have, you need all poles inside the unit circle for the system to be stable. Okay, so if you just have one outside, it's the same thing that you had on for continuous time systems. The system will become unstable, not stable. And in that sense, it diverges to infinity. So the system will not come to zero as required or following a reference signal. Of course, when you're talking about stability, the same as in the first semester, we are talking about asymptotic stability. Asymptotic stability means that if you give an impulse to the system, it doesn't matter how long it takes, but it will return to zero, no longer, no matter how long it takes. Of course, you've seen this slide on the first semester, but it's very important from the ethical perspective that I reinforce this aspect. Is just lacking stability a problem of bad poles? No, it's just not that, because you are engineers, and for engineers, having a lack of stability means catastrophic results. So plants will explode, airplanes will go down, the magnitude of the results could be very um, high with a, a strong impact in society and so ultimately we are talking about people's lives. So I call your attention to, to this aspect when you are designing a control system, stability it's not just another criteria, it's a very, it's a basic requirement, it's a very important aspect that you have to take in consideration. I introduced you the URIS test. URIS test is uh, like a Ralph Hurwitz for, this, for continuous systems. Now, URIS test is for the discrete. So, it's a way to check if the system is stable or not from the transfer function. Of course, because the poles are taken from the denominator, what you need is the polynomial that you have on the denominator. That polynomial is called the characteristic polynomial. And so you don't need to know the pole location, so you need, don't need compute. You can understand nowadays we have these tools like uh, Octave or MATLAB that immediately give the polynomial and you get the, 
the roots and from the roots you can see if they are inside or outside the unit circle so if the system is stable or not stable but um, sometimes you can use this test just for quickly examine if, it's, if a system is stable or not and if you have the characteristic polynomial PZ so the conditions are that this last element AN should be less than 1 in module so the absolute value should be less than 1 the value of the polynomial when you replace Z by 1 should be positive and P minus 1 so if you replace Z by minus 1 should be positive as well or negative depending if the n is odd or even so you just apply this formula and you check if the result is positive or not and if the system is second order these three rules are enough so I'm not introducing at this moment the other rules so you will, we will see it on the practical sessions later on so what about the zeros? zeros are related of course with the roots of the numerator and that's true for continuous and discrete systems but you know that when you multiply by s, a transfer function, you are making it the derivative of the signal. So s on the top is related with the derivation. And now you know that in z transform, when you multiply by z, what you're making is a shift on the signal. So you'll get the sense of it, you'll see that the, the, the meaning of the zeros will be a little bit different. But for instance, if when we are going to be playing with the root locus, you will get the same, that zeros will attract poles. In that sense, things will not change. So, in practice, when you start practicing these classes, you will get a more intuitive notion of the zeros. For instance, let's talk about the delays. Delays were quite difficult to make in continuous time systems because the transfer function of the delay is like exponential. The so transfer function is like a minus lambda s, where lambda is the delay. So you remember this from the first semester. And when people needed some to make a delay, they would get these kilometers of fiber optics before this uh, widespread of computer systems. Then you have this the, the fiber optic, and you would inject on one point the signal, and you would get it um, several kilometers later. For, with, with the delay, for instance, for testing a radar system or uh, in telecommunications for managing packages. Always now in the discrete time system, it's very, very easy because if you want to make an uh, n sample delay from the input to the output, you just need to have z to minus n, and z to minus n is just a chain of z minus 1, one after the other. So this is like a shift register. You inject the signal on one side and you'll get it on the other side delayed by n samples and you have this like this shift register at each clock uh, signal you would get one sample ahead in time the integrator the integrator is another important system that we already mentioned last week and we give this example and that's why we have this um, the savings peak um, in the sense that your pocket is like an integrator so, so this integration of what is coming in and less what is coming out is a good example of the integrator so for making the integrator you just need this difference equation the output at time k is the output at time k minus 1 plus the input in time k so this is like a regression where you're just putting in or putting out but if you put the input to zero it will keep it. So the output in time k it will be equal to the output in k minus 1. And so, and this is something that we already have for the continuous time system. When the input going to 0, the output will remain constant. So in a sense, if you make the transfer function of the system, and we did that last week, we see that the transfer function of the integrator has a pole in z equal to 1. So z equal to 1 is the new s equal to 0 that we had on the first semester so the integrator will be a pole at z equal to 1 so if you want to know what is the relationship between a continuous time system and a discrete time system the best way is to see how it moves to see if I put an impulse a continuous one on the continuous system or if I put an impulse on the discrete one on the discrete system I will get a superposition of two signals, yes or not. So if I have a good match between 
the continuous and the discrete outputs, I have a good discretization, so the good equivalence, so to say. And so we can analyze for, for a first order system and we can see that the relationship between um, the two respects this transformation is equal to E STS. So if you have poles in S that you want to know where it, they are the equivalent position in Z, you just apply this formula. So S times TS makes the exponential and you get the location in Z. And we are doing this already on the lab sessions for uh, designing controllers that look alike the ones in continuous time systems. So let's take a look how this formula goes. So in this formula, Z E S T S, when you have this region here where you have the real axis, so zero overshoot and going to zero to infinity, so the system will become with a more fast. Where is the image through this formula of such a place? And the result is this region between 0 and 1. What about this part of the imaginary axis? It doesn't make sense to go beyond the Nyquist frequency because the Nyquist frequency is the maximum frequency we can represent. So the image, if you pass it through this formula and you know that, that omega n is P divided by TS and you have another TS there and if you make the, the calculations you'll get that it will go through the borderline of the unit disk a semicircle that will make the frontier the borderline between stability and not non-stable regions the same as we had on the continuous time system now if you go with a thread a straight line from the Nyquist frequency in the imaginary axis towards the minus infinity in the real axis, the image of this is this part between minus 1 and 0. So all this region here goes in this semicircle on top and the same for the part below. And so this line is again between minus 1 and 0 and the all region here that you can see in a more darker color, which is our playground in continuous time system, if you will want it to, to be sampled, corresponds to the unit circle. Okay? You know that this part will suffer some aliasing, so we will not go beyond this part on the continuous time system if we want if we need an equivalent on the discrete time system. Of course, if we need these omega n to be larger, we just decrease the sampling period so we are working at a, some, a faster rate if we are working at a faster rate we have more bandwidth and it, but at the end so omega n will be larger but this region goes always inside the unit circle what happens now for instance for constant damping constant damping we have this straight line here on the continuous time system now we have the cardioid so the corresponding for continuous damping, you know, for instance, 45 degrees, we, we knew that corresponds to 5%. Now we have a cardioid line that goes from 1 to a point here. And what about, for instance, constant natural frequency? Constant natural frequency is now a, a line that is almost like a semicircle, um, especially for. Uh, low values of natural frequency but when we started to increase it goes it goes differently and it does not look like a semicircle so let's zoom in and what happens if we go with ts in direction of zero so if we take a look at this image without any additional information this could be s because you, you have like the imaginary axis here or this could be z, z equal to 1 and this would be a, a large amplification of the unit circle around z equal to 1 if we have the expansion in zero in Taylor series for z ESTS so we have all these elements but now if we are going to STS much less than 1 
So this second, third and fourth order and so on will be neglected and we can say the ESTS is almost like 1 plus STS and you know that S is negative because we are on the left half plane. So this means that if S much less than 1, Z will be equal to STS plus 1. For instance, if S STS is like 0, 0, 005, we are in 095. So the exponential value is 0912 and if we apply the formula is like 1 minus 005 is 095. So the meaning is that when you go with S TS in the direction of 0 and that can happen because TS is very small or the sampling rate is very high what, what will happen is that all poles and zeros will migrate in the direction of z equal to 1 and you will have a little bit a picture like this okay but this will be z, z equal to 1 and because you are amplifying a lot what you will have is that the circle will look uh, almost like a vertical line so with a high sampling rate when you put your computer working almost like a continuous time system what you will have is that all poles and zeros will go to the region around z equal to 1 and you will be working almost like you're developing uh, continuous uh, you're developing your system in continuous so but you know that that is expensive because if you have high sampling rate it means that you will have to pay a lot by your CPUs for your data acquisition uh, systems everything will have to be working with a higher uh, frequency and that costs money okay so we, it's always preferable if we can do the same with a lower rate with a larger sampling period thank you very much this is all for today so I'm hoping for your feedback I will make you uh, online session now with your doubts so feel free to, to put all the questions you want so today we talked about the transfer function, the pole zero mapping, stability, URIS test, delays and integrator, continuous discrete equivalence also as well. Thank you very much. So see you next week. Bye bye.